Thank you. No problem. And there's a little wait in between the YouTube. So now we're live, I believe. And I just wanted to thank everybody for tuning in to day two of Spring Breakout for Black Futures Forward. Um, today, we're going to be discussing CRT archives and community memory. Um, just having so many technical situations. Um, I wanted to let everybody know that we do have ASL for today so that people can follow along with us. And I wanted to introduce today's discussion partner, Zakia um, Collier. Did I, I said it wrong or no? Zakia? Zakia. <laughs> Zakia, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I wanted to introduce Zakia Collier, our uh, guest for the day. And my name is Teresa Rayford. Um, I just wanted to go ahead and say that it's an honor for us to be in conversation with you today because um, you are a Brooklyn-based Black queer archivist, a memory worker. Your work and research in the exploration of the role of cooperative thought and improvisation in the sustainability of immaterial cultural uh, memory, particularly in marginalized communities. Um, hopefully I'm not skipping anything and cultural heritage institutions. Uh, before joining Shift Collective as the community outreach person for documenting the now, which is Doc the Now, uh, in 2022, they have centered African American diaspora, uh, diaspora, and queer and community based organizations. Your previous experience includes the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, uh, the Weeksville Heritage Center, which I would love to learn more about both of those and Safe Word Society, uh, Marilyn Nance's Best Tax 77 collection and other private archival collections. Uh, you hold a BA in anthropology from the University of South Carolina in MLIS from Long Island University and an MA in media culture and communications. Oh, I'm so sorry that my phone is not uh, believing in the off button. It's been going off today. Um, and so an MA in Media, Culture and Communications from New York University. Uh, Zakia is a certified archivist through the Academy of Certified Archivists, ACA, and a guest co-editor of the forthcoming special issue of the Black Scholar on Black Archival Practice. So that just means you know so much and you've done so much to further your education and to further the preservation of our heritage, which I am, you know, of that diaspora, and I'm very appreciative of your time today. So thank you for being here with us. Yeah, Teresa, I, I'm so excited to be here with you. I am a huge fan of Don't Shoot Portland, and I, I wish I was able to come see your new installation in person, um, but maybe one day, you know, when um, we are not still going through a pandemic, but um, until then, <laughs> but I'm just so excited to be here um, and to be in conversation with you um, about such an important topic. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, and I was going to say that when I started looking over the work that you're doing, I'm really seeing how art intersects with our historical culture and the documentation and preservation of that. This past November, we went to Art Basel out in Miami and they might as well just call it Black Art Basel because I know they call it Black in Basel in some spaces, but the entire movement was taken over by our historical context and the way that we share um, our expressions and our narratives through art. And so I was very excited to have this conversation today because I wanted to learn a lot more about the work that you're doing. And especially like the Doc the Now stuff. We had Doc the Now come to Portland. I think it was like 2018 with uh, Professor Meredith Clark and Burgess and a couple of other, you know, um, professors and educators that were, you know, really engaging our community here to document the movement work and also the work of our elders before us, because obviously the baby boomers have a story to tell, but it seems like people stopped documenting, um, you know, once Dr. King and everybody had their place in history, it's like a lot of people whose stories should be told, we've never heard their names or learned their stories until like social media. And now we're able to share more collectively um, as community 
And a lot of people say like places like Portland, like there is no black community. Well, with the access to the web and really trying to find our homes and our, and our families, um, we're starting to build community. And I wanna kind of encourage people to continue doing that. And so I hope that wasn't too much, but I wanted to learn more about your work directly just in your words. Yeah, um, all right, all of my work. Um, <laughs> Do I ever sit down is the question. Um, so there is so much, but I, I won't, um, you know, be OD in this moment. But, um, you know, specifically, uh, well, I'll, I'll start with the work that I'm doing now with uh, Documenting the Now and Shift Collective. So I just started a new role as community manager um, um, for Documenting the Now and uh, which is a project, a team, a collective group of people and community um, that is focused on ethical social media documentation um, with a specific focus on Twitter, but really wanting to, um, you know, sort of as we think about archives in the standard sense and the art, the, the practices of ethics that are sometimes present, sometimes not, um, but should be uh, present, but wanting to sort of apply that to social media archiving, which is, you know, new, like we're on social media, we're doing it, we're active with it, um, but wanting to create ways for it to be more ethical and for people to consent and, and to know what's happening with their, um, you know, what's happening with their tweets and their posts and, and the things that they're saying online in public forums um, and the ways that researchers, archivists um, may be using that, that information. Um, and so there's, there's more soon on that front, um, but this is a, a new role for me, but um, so that's documents in the now. And then um, most recently, I worked as the digital archivist at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture um, here in New York. And in that position, I worked on a project called the Hashtag Schomburg Syllabus, um, which aimed to do a whole lot of things, um, but sort of um, merge web archiving with a celebration of the ways that uh, Black communities, Black librarians, um, memory workers, archivists, um, activists have worked to sort of circulate information about our communities and about, you know, the things that we're going through, through reading lists, through um, bibliographies, reading groups, um, and most recently through hashtag syllabi um, in response to um, different social injustices like police brutality, police murders. Um, we are able, let me be clear, let me clarify, not murder of the police, police murdering black people. <laughs> um, just need to be clear on that. Um, and so sort of in those moments, uh, people kicking into action in a number of ways. Of course, we have people in the streets, we have people who are focusing on uh, the legal side, but we also have educators and students um, and people who are just interested in, in providing more resources on um, what's going on for students, for our youth, and so that we can be more informed about our histories and, um, you know, able to take action and just really have a deep understanding of what we are experiencing and the precedent that exists for things that are happening now um, that are rooted in slavery, rooted in um, lynching and so on and so forth. Um, and so using web archiving to sort of document uh, hashtag syllabi as well as uh, just documenting Black culture online in general. Um, and then Weeksville Heritage Center, <laughs> which is a um, free Black, uh, uh, was a free Black um, community in the uh, 19th and 20th centuries um, in Brooklyn, New York. So like five minutes away from uh, my apartment and um, 
Weeksville um, sort of was a vibrant, active community um, from the early 19, uh, 1830s, excuse me, through the early 1930s um, and was rediscovered again in the 1960s by local activists, um, archaeologists, students, and community members who came together um, to recover this history. And so now Weeksville Heritage Center exists as a historic house museum where four homes are preserved from historic Weeksville. Um, and the center aims to continue documenting Weeksville's history as well as um, Black history and, and the history of Central Brooklyn broadly. Um, and so there, I worked on a project called the Linking Lost Jazz Shrines Project, um, which celebrates and preserves the histories of um, the Central Brooklyn jazz community from um, roughly the 1930s to the 1960s and sort of just this vibrant community that is not um, well documented or, or talked about um, and once uh, there once existed these these shrines with the projects called Linking Lost Jazz Shrines. So all of these venues and jazz um, jazz venues and clubs and bars that um, this history was situated in. And as uh, gentrification happens, many of those spaces do not exist anymore and have become a number of different things, um, losing that sort of place-based history. Um, and so the project aims to, to preserve that history and make it accessible um, through linked data, which I will not get into. Uh, this is just very technical, but um, um, yeah, just making that history, bringing that history to the forefront yet again and, um, and making it more accessible. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm gonna stop there so we can talk about what we came to talk about. <laughs> Absolutely, and I, I wanted to ask real quick because there is a lot of work that you're involved in, but what made you interested in this work? Like, the, obviously this is spring breakout, so our audience is hopefully uh, youth and other people that are encouraged and informed um, through preservations or are looking for those opportunities. But when I've looked at that, that skill set in that industry, it's most overwhelmingly white. And so I'm always excited to find that there are networks of people that look like me that have, you know, historical context that might match my families um, that are in this because now we get to have people that understand us also share the research. Um, so how did you get involved in archiving and memory work? What inspired you? Yeah, um, so Interestingly enough, it's something that I came to very organically, like as a child. Um, so I have always sort of stewarded my own materials. Um, let me not say always. My mom did. And then I took over um, when I was about five or six and was like, OK, I want to keep track of like my awards. I want to keep track of all the, the VCR tapes and like I want, you know, everything, my artwork, um, um, photographs, and like wanted to put them in order and like keep them safe, but also keep them accessible to me. Um, because, you know, I had a one of those black mamas who's like, don't come in my room. So like, <laughs> I was like, okay, well, then it's not accessible. So I want to be able to access my own histories. Um, you know, all five years of it, I want to be able to see it and like learn something about myself from like this thing I did last year that I forgot about now, um, which I think is, you know, sort of one of the uses of like, you know, traditional archives is like being able to kind of look back and learn from and, and you know, let it inform you again, um, you know, be informed by your own experiences. And so, yeah, just have been doing that since I was a kid. And um, of course, didn't have the language for it, um, but always understood that preserving my own experiences was important um, for whatever reason. It was just like, 
no, this needs to be here um, and it needs to be accessible and it needs to be in order. Um, and like, I would organize everybody's, uh, everybody's files on our, our family computer. Like, mm -mm, this is not like, this is a mess. I need this to make sense to you. It's not even my account, but I'm gonna organize it. And so um, didn't have the language for it until um, undergrad where um, I did a, my, my undergrad thesis in anthropology was sort of a um, uncovering of the Black Power movement in South Carolina, which is typically not a place that people think about um, there being Black Power um, movements and activities, but there was a, there's a significant history that um, was silenced and suppressed through, um, through the media and through sort of official record coming from um, politicians and leaders. And so I wanted to analyze that by like actually looking at certain events and having an oral history next to the headline, next to a government, a governor's speech about the same occurrence and actually would see the language of like, you know, there are outside agitators that are coming in and, um, and, and causing this ruckus where the oral history is like, no, I'm South Carolina born and bred. And like, I started this thing or like, I did this thing. I went and did the research. I invited the people from, you know, New York to come down and do this. Or I invited someone up from, you know, for, or over from California to do this. And so um, just wanting to, to put that together. And so at that point I became aware of, um, of the power of, of archival documents and, um, you know, being held a like official copy of, of something um, from COINTELPRO, like an actual document. Like I was like, oh. and one of my um, interlocutors uh, in the oral history was like, you can, you can keep this. And I was like, what? Like, do you know that I keep everything? Like, I, I'm going to have this for forever. Are you sure you want me to keep it? And like, he was like, okay. So um, yeah, at that point I became aware of the profession, but like, or aware of like what I was doing or the language for what I had been doing. Um, but it wasn't until like sort of reading black feminist scholarship in grad school and like reading uh sort of the work of like uncovering black stories in the archive and the difficulty of doing that um, because of erasure or silencing or, you know, the, the stories of black people not having been documented at all, um, or at least not documented in the traditional way that it would end up in an official archive. Um, it was at that point that I was like, okay, wait, so I've kind of been doing this my whole life. I want to do it from the other side and like figure out what needs to happen on the archival side so that Black people can access their own histories and so that Black people can access the tools that they need to preserve their own histories going forward so that we don't run into this problem. And so I kind of went gun ho into like, boom, I'm gonna do this like, MLS program and get this degree and like here I am <laughs> so yeah and thank goodness you're where you are I was going to say that when you bring up the fact that when you have these documents there's this power because there's like this is evidence this is something that confirms a lot of things that we hear like we hear the stories. I remember when I was a child and my grandmother used to say, yeah, we had to walk seven miles to get to school and all this. And I'd be like, wow, she just wants me to get up early and go to school. But then as I matured and, and grew up and started my own research, I was like, wow, they didn't have schools in the region where she was, you know, a child. And it was a hardship getting there. And if you got there alive or if your family could afford to let you go, 
that was a big deal, you know, and I mean, you know, that kind of highlights the inequities that we see even today, but having that knowledge made it less of a thing that I would say, oh, they just didn't try hard enough or all oh, that generation. I remember like when protests first started and people were like, we are not our grandparents generation, but I knew so much about the resistance of my grandparents and people before them that I was like, shoot, we show sure ain't because they would have, you know, they would probably be a lot further than we are now. And I think it was because they did have that shared knowledge, even if they didn't have the traditional spaces to document things. I think as a culture, I mean, as a people, we were able to share stories that came through generation to generation. And now we get to research those stories to find evidence of the things that were were being said to us. Um, and that brings me to the question and focus basically of this program is like, what is CRT? And a lot of people don't understand if it's a legal term or if it's a historical context, um, but I think that it's applied experience in either realm and however you receive it. Uh, what does CRT mean to you as an archivist and as someone that does this type of work? Um, and sees power in, in receiving and, and being able to witness and, and research documents that otherwise would not be made available to us, especially in a generation of banning books. Yeah. Oh, oh my goodness. I have like so many thoughts. Like every time I um, like hear something or see something about like this discussion of CRT, um, I'm just like, what like where are like I'm just so confused I'm like okay we have so many things that we should be worrying about you know like pandemic but like <laughs> it's like oh let's like pick a fight with CRT in like elementary schools which I could survey a million people right now and be like did you or did you not learn about CRT in middle in like elementary school and it would be a resounding no, um, because I'm like, I didn't even learn the term until grad school. And it was sort of, from what I recall, like fleeting and like just in a text and it wasn't sort of a discussion um, or like something that was mentioned on the syllabus, but it was sort of cited in someone else's work. Um, and at that point I, I began researching to, figure out what it was but yeah it just I'm just so confused as to why this has become uh such a huge concern um in in sort of all spaces but I think um what it means to me or the way that I've understood it at is as a a framework to sort of understand um how racism works within laws and institutions um, and as a framework to sort of study and address that racism and how it shows up. Um, I've understood it as being nuanced and complex um, and subtle in that, you know, when it, uh, sort of was developed in the mid 70s, um, it was a way to describe what people had already been experiencing and knew that like there were unfair consequences for black people for certain things or that there were disparate outcomes within the legal system for black people. And so I understand it as a framework to or created as a framework to understand and put language to and actually identify what that looks like um, on a you know case by case basis um, and it has I think over time been applied in a lot of different field and spaces and um, archives is is included in that um, and so. Um, Anthony Dunbar um, authored an article in 2006 that was called, I'm gonna look it up over here, Introducing Critical Race Theory 
to archival discourse, like, you know, straight up answering the question, you know, like, okay, what does it look like to apply critical race theory to archival discourse? Um, and so in this article, um, Dunbar kind of talks about the similarities between like the legal system and archives because of this like evidence-based and fact-based approach that kind of exists in both professions and both spaces um, and saw CRT as a way to, um, to identify and address racial biases in collections in in collecting and like sort of all the processes that surround the preservation and, and access of documents like in an archival space. Um, and so, He, he sort of describes CRT as like being useful in actually identifying like microaggressions and identifying, you know, uh, like using CRT methods to identify on a granular level, like there is a racial bias in this. Like if we did, you know, an analysis to say like, is there racial bias in like this specific institution's archival collections and using critical race theory to do that um, with, with the sort of methods that are already established as being a part of critical race theory. Um, and so I think for me, having read that article um, early in my career, um, I, I kind of had some some concerns about the usefulness um, in the present. So this was like long after 2006, but um, I thought it was, I mean, the full title of the piece is uh, Introducing Critical Race Theory to Archival Discourse, Getting the Conversation Started. And I think that's exactly what it did was it got the conversation started around concerns of racism in archival practice and the profession. Um, I think me coming to it in like 2017, I was kind of like, okay, it's been established that there's racism, like we have answered the question. Um, the conversation has been started, now what do we do about it? Um, because you know some of the solutions were like counter stories for example so like having a story that contradicts maybe what is already in, on the record um so maybe you have a document in an archival institution um that says this but you know your experience to be the complete opposite of what the official record says and there is, you know, the opportunity to do an oral history or provide your own documents if you documented your experience of that same situation. Um, but I think what troubled me was that when it comes to Black people um, and, and other communities that have been robbed of their ability to um, to respond in, in the system in the, in the way that it was intended to be. Um, there, there isn't the same, the process just isn't the same. Like you can provide your counter story, but you're also, you could also be become a target for more harm by providing your counter story. Um, and so I was, it was kind of like, okay, yes, you can provide your story. Um, but then there, there's a need to sort of be even more careful and to take more steps that for me weren't answered in the article. Um, so I, I felt like it was a conversation starter and it very much so articulated the, the foundations of understanding racism in, archi in the archival profession um, and in practice. But it didn't talk about, you know, sort of the pervasiveness and, and the ability to or the lack of ability to really um, do more after you've identified 
the racism or after you've identified the white supremacist impact on the situation um, and avoid further harm. And that's kind of how I how I see it, because I understand the application, but I'm always thinking that we're always going to continue evolving like, oh, wow, there's good. It's, it's great that we have this theory now, but now we have to take it and kind of manifest it so that it's useful to us continuance because um, one of the things that you said earlier was like, I don't know why, you know, so many people are connecting to it or are upset about it or are dealing with it. And I think that for like our generation um, coming post President Obama and then going right into Donald Trump and then going into where we are now, where we're seeing like this whole global anti-blackness, this anti-blackness that's happening globally. Um, we can really look at our concerns, like in the school to prison pipeline, we can look at our concerns and our history of, you know, getting access to health care and housing and all these different things. And now we're able to explore like we're, we're able now because we're not the silent generation to speak up and speak out about these things. But I think that it helps aid in our research to kind of see how information has been applied and specifically to black Americans, the way that, you know, punitive measures have been created in order to kind of address our issues. Um, one of the issues I have is like, I'll read legal language um, that is supposed to be like community centered, but it'll call children like at risk, marginalized and disadvantaged. And then when you look at how that language is applied through the criminal justice system, it's like they're looking for us to commit a crime and they're waiting on us to commit a crime so that they can refer us to agencies. It's not that they see that there is a vulnerable community that needs investment or you know, resources for educators and families or housing or jobs. It's like, no, we have to identify them because they're at risk. And mm -hmm. it, it just comes into to, like as an organizer, it's easy to use that language to connect with our community to get them to provide testimony that shows how um, oppressive and discriminative and biased it is. And I think that even before I knew what critical race theory was, I was always critical of documents that I would receive when trying to advocate for community. I'd be like, whoa, what is this? Like, this is an insult to my, you know, my humanity. What are you trying to put together here? And there would be so many quiet people around the table saying, look what we did, as if they were providing us something that was good. So I think most of the reason that there's this big uproar about it is that some people love the silent majority being able to just pass off instructions and directives and mandates that, you know, still channel that bias. Um, and people are now aware of it. So they're just finding ways to kind of, you know, fight back. <laughs> Um, and even like, you know, one of the things that I talked to you about the other day, I was excited because when we talk about the criminal justice system, it's basically documenting things that have happened and then utilizing policy to kind of petition to lawmakers or petition in a courtroom um, to have those barriers removed so that we can see a person as human. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we know in this country, people like us were not even considered human, not fully. Um, and that was a practical part of of creating policy to like keep people safe, which is again, a contradiction that is dehumanizing in its, in its effort. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think like in, in response to that, like, like you said, you know, always being critical of, of documentation and things that you receive. And I think that's, that's so key um, in, in thinking about documentation and, and also, um, the criminal justice system is like, just cause it's on paper, you know, doesn't mean it's true um, or doesn't mean it's true to your own experience. And it may be true to someone else's experience which may be an experience that has caused harm to you. Um, but, you know, th that's not the only story. And so, um, you know, I'm critical of everything all the time. Um, and it's just like, <laughs> okay, well, could it be something else? Could we think about this differently? Like what might not be, what, you know, what, what might be missing from, from this document or from this collection um, or, you know, from this perspective. And so I think, you know, what my impression was with critical race theory um, to like build on what I was sharing before is I think 
it it took us to the point of like identifying the the issues and like being critical of what you see or critical of the the biases or the racism um or anti-blackness that is present within like an archival institution but it's kind of like okay so once you've identified it and maybe you have a counter story um there is the issue of like black seeing black people as human and that fight intersects with the archive and archival practice but it also exists outside of that space um of like how are you fighting at you you as an archivist how are you fighting for Black people to be seen as human every day and not just in your archival repository where you work? Um, because it, it just goes so much further than that. Um, then like, okay, you have the counter story, it's documented. Now, can we turn that into policy? Can we, you know, abolish something now that we know that like this perspective has purposefully um, or this occurrence has like purposefully created a harm or taken a life um, and so on and so forth. Talk to us a little bit about um, your program, the call to action for archiving, um, let me see, uh, state sanctioned violence against black people, which is something that we've done using artwork. Um, we've done, we did in 2017, an art installation called Stolen Angels and it was literally screen prints of all these children that had been murdered by either the police or white supremacists in our community. And we put legal documents and news articles and then also um, personal items from their family together with the installation along with a video to kind of not humanize them because obviously the children were already human. They were black children, but we wanted to kind of speak to our community because at the time we were like, why won't black people, you know, in Portland, obviously, show up for black lives, for showing up for, you know, the protests and all the things that were happening at that time. But to me, it was incredible that we had this movement that was really kind of um, engaging these issues, but we couldn't get people from our own community to show up. So when we did this installation, we in, 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 um, intentionally, utilized people that were from our community in the installation to bring their true life stories into a space where people could feel comfortable showing up. Mm -hmm. and, um, and when we did that, that kind of created an infrastructure where everyone had to pay attention because now we were using art to kind of bring this big focal point into the play. And then there was this realization that all of us could engage in it and that it did have something to do with everyone that, you know, even if you never showed up to a protest or you didn't have a child that was killed in gun violence or, you know, affected by police brutality, that because of your position in the world, in this city, um, that it still affects you. And we were hoping that because people would seem affected, that they would do the work to dismantle it. I think that archiving um, state sanctioned violence against black people is super important because it continues to give us that way out. Um, again, it's evidence. If no one says anything is a problem, which a lot of people don't know to fight back, then it doesn't continue to be a problem. I know a couple of years ago, we weren't talking about um, state sanctioned violence, even though we all had saw the Rodney King video and we knew about all these people being shot, but it just seems like with Trayvon Martin and then with you know, um, Michael Brown, that it started erupting into uprisings. And then we had Freddie Gray and we had Sandra Bland and we had Eric Garner and Natasha McKenna and Tamir Rice and all these different humans. Now it wasn't just a black man shot in the back or a black child murdered. It was, we knew who they were. We connected with their families. And again, I attribute that to social media. So um, just, <laughs> I hope I didn't go off too much, but just if you wouldn't, wouldn't mind talking to us about archiving state sanctioned violence against black people. Yeah, um, so I mean, the, the piece that you're referring to um, was sort of co-authored by myself and other black memory workers um, in June, 2020. Um, and it came out of sort of, you know, we were 
at, at, you know, three months into the pandemic and sort of seeing all of these different um, occurrences of state sanctioned violence um, and including the pandemic uh, and the ways that it was disproportionate, disproportionately affecting Black communities, um, seeing that as a form of state sanctioned violence as well, um, and neglect and, and not providing resources, um, you know, every day in terms of, of health uh, related resources for Black communities, um, and, and all the other ways that um, Black folks are disenfranchised or like not you know, able to get jobs where health insurance is provided and not, you know, et cetera, et cetera, all the different ways, seeing all of these things as uh, forms of state sanctioned violence. Um, and also noticing and knowing the profession that we're in that like, as things happen, things are shiny, whether they're good or bad, you know, like, there is this impetus to say like, okay, yes, we need to document this, we got to get this. And like, got to make sure this is on the record, um, all the ways that like people are responding to the pandemic or all the ways that people are responding to, um, you know, sort of more explicit forms of state section violence. Um, and so we wanted to like say something and, and do something and say like, okay, yes, this is something that definitely needs to be documented because we are aware of how the story gets changed really quickly. Um, and there's all of a sudden like that didn't happen or the, these aren't the facts or all of a sudden images that were once available online have been shrubbed and like you can't find them. Um, and so understanding the need to, to document for accountability in order to you know, be able to pursue, pursue legal rights and pursue different routes uh, for sort of remediating or redressing the harm and, and, and the violence, um, but also wanting to encourage uh, specifically um, professional archivists um, to like be intentional and be aware of what they were actually deciding to bring into their collections and into their institutions and be aware of like you deciding to document this means that you are agreeing to care for this thing, like care for this documentation and care for the subjects that are mentioned in this documentation. And if that's not something that you are doing in your collecting practice, then like it's something you should consider or um, consider leaving the documentation of, of Black experiences, specifically um, of Black experiences with state-sanctioned violence to Black people and Black memory workers um, who, you know, care about all the different types of Black people and actually value Black life. Um, and so wanting to sort of avoid this professional opportunism of like some institutions being like, we had like the biggest collection of, I don't know, like they do really silly things. So like we have the biggest collection of like, I don't know, something very, uh, just like it just doesn't make sense or they, they make a collection accessible and then, you know, it, it falls into the hands of the police, for example, and, and then causes harm to people that maybe they were intending to protect and preserve their stories, but didn't move with intention in like how they made the, the collections accessible or, you know, preserving photos of, of protests and actions and not getting permission from the people who were pictured in those photos. Um, and so just wanting to put out a statement that encouraged people to be more thoughtful and intentional and perhaps move, move slower with, with their documentation in order to, to have that intention, um, especially if it's something you're gonna be making accessible to the public. 
Um, I think on the other side of that, with people documenting their own experiences or the experiences of their communities, um, you know, that the the um, the piece really wasn't that wasn't really the focus, but you know, sort of reading between the lines, you could see that like this is where that work should be happening, right, in our communities of like, this is my experience with this thing. This is actually how, you know, this protest went. Um, you know, these are the things that we saw um, and getting that documentation so that it can be used for accountability um, and, and all of the possible needs or even to just have that documentation of your own experiences of this thing. And so like, you don't, you know, you aren't gaslit by the government or gaslight yourself of like, no, 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 like things are not that bad. And it's like, no, 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 you actually have it documented, like check your journal where you experienced this thing on this day. Your coworker said X, Y, Z to you, you know, like you experienced this on the train or so on and so forth. But like making sure that these experiences, big and small, um, as it relates to, to state sanctioned violence um, or you know, race and anti-black violence in general, um, making sure to like have that documentation is always, you know, important for like all the reasons. And you are so right because what I'm looking at now in 2022, like it's literally just 2022. And I'm already seeing like the gaslighting and the co-opting of the movement be utilized and transferred into collective hands of people that are still oppressing Black people and still show bias in, in political infrastructures and educational infrastructures. I'm looking at like the work of people that showed up on the front line being used to kind of prop up people that are like, you know, not really, that, that are like securely supporting the status quo, which can ignore race. Right, which is that group of people that look like all of us that are saying, hey, I don't see race, I'm trying to do something right. And I'm like, wow, when you even say that you're trying to do something this way or you're trying to do something right or you're trying to do something that's not divisive, that's literally taking away the voice of those people that have the courage to say something was wrong rather than to strengthen their concerns with showing information or affirming them and, and bringing validity to it. It's like they've transferred the work into their own repertoire and then they use their use of it and their status to kind of say that they're doing it in this right way and it's and what i'm looking at is that it's making people that have made concerns and promises to the black people across the world and saying they were going to do better they don't have to do better they just now have to work with these status quo people or these people in power that don't really listen to the people. And so I'm, <laughs> I'm glad that you had that type of call to action because there are so many documented, like from this year, from that year, um, when I look back like 10 years all the way, even back to Trayvon Martin, the way that things were being explained, the off the cuff editorials, the opinion editorials, the blogs, all of the different mediums that people were able to inform and share. I saw so many people showing up for the cause and being consistent in building a narrative that did support the human rights campaign and the basic dignity of those people that did show up. And so I thank you for utilizing your platform and your industry to kind of develop that, um, that access for us, you know, because <laughs> it's, it's so hard to watch it every year. And like you said, a lot of information does disappear. You'll get that uh, 404, you know, response mm -hmm. to a website where you're like, wait a minute, this was some really good stuff, but it's no longer there. And it could be a local media agency or a national agency. And it's like, wait a minute, they have documents and information from years before this incident. Why is this information now unavailable? Why is it missing? You know, like, did they wake up and be conscious for a minute and then someone goes in and says, remove that information because those don't those don't reflect our values as an organization or like why does information come up lost and how do we slow down the gaslighting? Is it continued documentation <laughs> that we have to do? 
Right, exactly. And, you know, uh, you know, one line in the call to action is sort of like that we know there's like a, a propensity for this documentation to disappear, you know, like whether it's the documentation of our own experiences or, you know, an institution saying, we, yeah, we were wrong, we're going to do better. And then like, completely erase where they claim that they did wrong. And, you know, without that documentation, we still have the strength and um, the value of our own experiences. But, you know, we do live in a country that everything is validated by paperwork, you know, like, which I hate. I hate paperwork so much. <laughs> As an archivist, I'm like, uh, like <laughs> so many like different processes and like this paper you gotta fill out this form and this form and you know in many ways that that makes it more accessible and makes people not want to go through the full process because they have to you know do the, so many steps they have to like have this particular literacy of like legal process or you know you mentioned uh doing um FOIA Freedom of Information Act there's a there's a learning curve to that. Like you have to know how to do it, what words to put in in order for them to to actually access, uh, grant you access to a specific form, and um, it's it's built that way on purpose, right? It's so that you know everybody is just not like, yes, government, you said you were gonna give us access, so like give us access. They're like, no, you have to actually know how to use the system and use the right <laughs> words and like. And we're not going to tell you how to do it. We're going to let you figure that out on your own. Um, even though like you're, you're clearly there for a reason, right? You're like asking for this documentation for a reason. Um, and so, yeah, it's just like, there's always something when it comes to like, you know, trying to access these things. And, um, you know, if, if we aren't, you know, paying attention to the documentation, especially with things online. Like, you know, we think about documents and things like things that were collected during COINTELPRO or, um, you know, all so sorts of like sort of uh, surveillance of, of Black people and Black movements that happens and then they redact it and then we, we don't have access to it. But in online spaces, you know, the whole thing disappears. Like there can be redaction and like, you know, but it doesn't look redacted. You just see something different altogether. Um, unless you have access to a previous version, you may not know that like something has been changed, something has been removed. Um, and so, you know, understanding the importance of, you know, social media web archiving tools um, or social media archiving tools and then web archiving tools to be able to get access to previous versions of a specific document or, or statement um, to say, no, 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 you changed this because I have a, you know, we love our receipts, especially on social media and be like, this you, you know, like, <laughs> um, here's, the, here's the previous version, I have it right here. Um, and I, I, you know, I love, I love black people and our receipts. It's a, it's a whole, um a whole concept um so yeah yep. just like <laughs> it's our bag to like if we don't have anything else but receipts we know that's our credit mm -hmm. uh, i was going to ask you so you have a podcast um organizing ideas podcast is that still going on or how do you how how do people join the podcast and what are some of the discussions um, in regards to organizing ideas, I wanted to kind of get into there so that people can know how to engage with you more on these subjects. So, okay, so I actually did a, an episode of organizing ideas, but it's actually not my podcast, um, but it is uh, some, some dear colleagues of mine. So I would highly recommend people still check it out. Um, but no, it's not, not my podcast. Um, but my episode, I kind of talked a little bit about what I, I spoke about at the beginning of like web archiving um, and, and my work at the Schomburg Center. Um, but yeah, not, not my podcast, but maybe one day I'll have one. Yes, I think you should. I mean, it seems like there's so much deep information 
um, in the discussion about archives that kind of helps us center, you know, ourselves to think critically. Um, we become more informed and that way we're sharing, we're having better dialogues with people rather than discussing issues and not having any kind of thoughts or ideas around moving forward. Uh, we get stuck in that space and that can become triggering. And a lot of people keep talking about, you know, Black self-care and Black joy. And I'm like, moving forward is a part of that. But how do we move forward if we don't understand what we have right now? at stake. And so I think that these discussions kind of add a layer of liberation um, for us to kind of unpeel and, 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 you know, pull some of those things that are not ours that we don't need to be shouldering and holding on to um, because they are, you know, parts of upholding white supremacy. But again, the more we learn, uh, the better we feel, you know, okay. evidence. <laughs> Yeah, we, we blew through this hour. We only have a couple of minutes left. And so I wanted to ask you if you had any thoughts or ideas that you wanted to share with people um, or any call to action specifically. Hmm. Any call to action? Um, you know, Love I think people engaged. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess my only call to action would be just, I mean, pretty much what, what we've been discussing, like to keep those receipts, you know, like as you experience things, you know, good receipts, bad receipts, you know, I keep receipts on my doctor's offices. Everybody got a receipt. Okay? <laughs> like you will not come back to me and say like that this is not what happened. You yes. know, in the same way that some people are like, you know, when you when you ask for a specific type of care and you're at the doctor's office and they're like, no, I'm not going to give you that test. Then you're like, put it in my chart that like you're denying me, you used to give me <laughs> this thing. And so in that same way, you know, I keep receipts on my property management, my apartment, like everybody got a receipt. And so um, I think just just being active, the call to action is to like be active in the documentation of your own life, good, bad, ugly, state sanctioned violence, you know, family moments, um, just being more intentional and active with that. Um, you know, we, we can download our social, our personal social media accounts, um, and, uh, you know, there are a number of tools that, that, that walk you through like how to do that for yourself um, so that you have those accounts because uh, social media itself is not an archive and uh, your materials can disappear tomorrow in the same way that, you know, official statements from, from government or police, et cetera, can disappear tomorrow. So can your social media accounts. Um, especially if you are advocating for yourself as, as a black person, you know, things can disappear. Um, and so being active in that set a reminder, you know, every couple months or, you know, however often you want to, to like re-download your social media, depending on how active you are. Um, keeping you know, like keeping documentation of like the beautiful parts of your life. And um, cause that matters too, right? Like, yes. um, you know, the, the beautiful, I think there's like one time this, this image circulating of like Rosa Parks doing yoga. And it's like, yes, like we understand her place in the movement, but like, we also want to know like what people do to stay sane and what are their practices and like, how do they spend their time outside of or within these spaces? You know, like the beautiful videos of people singing at protests and dancing. And it's like, yes, that that is just as valid and just as important to the movement work um, as, you know, the, the actual reasons that you're there for. So, um, you know, just like getting all this documentation, backing it up. Yeah. Um, and organizing it so just not collecting it and then like no labels you don't know what it is <laughs> so making sure the label thing um but the yeah <laughs> the catalog. exactly you gotta catalog it for yourself spreadsheets um you know just just keeping track of your own experiences 
um because a, a wonderful colleague of mine um Stephen Fullwood always says that like we deserve to to have the benefit of our own experience and so um you want to benefit from that and and um and also hold systems accountable and and like you said Teresa um to indict the system. So you do that with receipt. <laughs> yes, I could see a whole generation walking around and asking and asserting and documenting information and being able to respond to things that are, you know, happening in their lives because they have that documentation. And I really appreciate the work that you do and that the time that you provided for us to share and to learn. And I'm thankful that everyone tuned in and I'm thankful for the people that will see this later. And I hope that they take you up on that and start doing their research. And again, all of us are essential in this world. All of our experiences are valid and documenting those experiences is a reminder, not just for ourselves, but for our future selves to be able to develop standards and values that right now probably don't exist in the world. And so um, thank you, you know, thank you so much for your time and energy. And are there any websites or books that people um, just off the top of your head that people might be able to find more information? And I can add that to the chat later on. Um, ooh, I'm Maybe like, your oh. favorite book. <laughs> oh, there's like, you see all these books. It's I know. <laughs> so I'm like, Maybe which one of those do I need to get? I know we. <laughs> I'm like I gotta choose one um <laughs> or a couple anything off the top of your head just <laughs> um, well you know in in preparation for this conversation like around critical race theory um I did pull out um Derek Bell's faces at the bottom of the well um which Derek Bell is a, a critical race uh theorist or uh, sort of was is associated with the 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 conceptual framework um Let's see, what else would I recommend? Um, I'm just gonna like start then naming a whole bunch of people. So um, <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna leave it there because we're talking about critical race theory. Yes. And um, I would just say, you know, follow the work of, of black memory workers, um, you know, and archivists. And uh, there's so many amazing uh, people out, out here um so yeah thank you thank you so much and thank you to our asl interpreters and our audience everybody have a great spring breakout and subscribe to our channel for tomorrow's program thank you Zahia. thank you bye-bye bye-bye so i gotta learn how to shut it down <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>